Squids are shrinking. Birds are migrating. Lizards are getting blown away by hurricanes. The signs are everywhere. Animals are changing because of climate change. But few people expected it to happen so fast. We asked biologist Tor Hansen to walk us through three animal adaptation experiments. We know that climate change is making hurricanes stronger in one of the best examples comes to us from the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean, where a small anole lizard, a distant relative of the iguana, is facing increasing challenges due to hurricanes. There's a female. Anolis scriptus on Pine Key. Soon after, field biologist Colin Donahue went to the Turks and Caicos in 2017 to study and take measurements of the lizards. Back-to-back -back hurricanes Irma and Maria devastated the islands, creating the perfect laboratory for him to study natural selection in response to climate change in real time. It wasn't just one hurricane, it was two strong hurricanes. Had any lizards survived those hurricanes? And if so, was the post-hurricane population different from the one he had just measured? When he re-measured all those lizards out in the wild, he found that the survivors of the hurricanes were different. They all had larger toe pads, and they also had shorter back legs when compared to the population he'd measured beforehand. So the lizards that had small toe pads and large, long back legs perished during that wind event. So to prove that the lizards with the shorter back legs and larger toe pads were more fit to survive during a hurricane, Donahue tested how lizards reacted to winds by aiming his leaf blower at them. He needed to see how the lizards behaved during hurricane force winds. And since you can't be out there taking notes on lizards during a real hurricane, he decided to recreate one with the leaf blower on the porch of his hotel room. He put a dowel that was similar to the size of the sticks that a lizard would hold onto in the wild. So there's the lizard placed upon the dowel with the leaf blower on hurricane force winds legs slipping free, flying in the wind. As the wind speed increased, you can see the lizard's back legs flying free and its whole body flying like a flag in the wind and it's gone. <laughs> and I should say that no lizards were harmed in the experiment itself. He had a soft net that caught all the lizards and they were also returned to the wild safely later. Then he understood that when the lizard is flapping like a flag in the wind, shorter back legs reduce the drag and it can hold on for a few seconds longer. And that might be the difference between survival or death. What Colin realized was that he had measured evolution in action, survival of the fittest, natural selection playing out not over thousands of years, but in the course of a single field season. And then he looked at the same question from a wider viewpoint across the whole Caribbean. Wherever strong hurricanes are more frequent, we see the same features in the anole lizards, the bigger toe pads, the stronger front legs, and the shorter back legs. About 2,500 miles away, a series of marine heat waves swept through the Gulf of California, warming the surface temperature of the water and impacting various species, including the Humboldt squid. Humboldt squid are also known as jumbo squid because they grow so large. They can be three, four, five, even six feet in length. Fishers in the Gulf of California were the first people to notice that something had changed when they stopped catching the Humboldt squid. When the scientists arrived to study this situation, they found that in fact the Humboldt squid were still there and in some places more plentiful than before. What had changed was their lifestyle and their body. These were not immature or juvenile squid. They were Humboldt squid at full size, reproducing and carrying out their lives in half the time they used to. Dr. William Gilly and his team measured the squid they caught and found a reduction of 50% or more in their body size in response to the stress of the higher water temperatures. This adaptation is known as plasticity. Plasticity is widely distributed in nature. Some species have a lot of it, like the Humboldt squid. Some species have very little. Plasticity is already built into the genome of a species. It's already there. One example of plasticity occurs when we travel to high altitudes, 
Our body adapts to the low density of the air and less oxygen by making more red blood cells to compensate. When we return to sea level, our body feels more energized. So can the fact that the Humboldt squid thrived in higher numbers in its new fun size be considered a win for the species? Climate change biologists are reluctant to identify winners and losers in this great struggle for survival, but certainly species that have a plastic response the way those squid do have a great advantage over species with limited plasticity. From the warm waters of Mexico, we travel to the frigid north to study another example of plasticity, behavioral plasticity, in the feeding patterns of this arctic bird. I think we're all familiar with that iconic climate change image of the polar bear stranded on a shrinking iceberg. But if you could look beyond the bear to the edge of the ice, you might catch a glimpse of a tiny seabird called the little auk or dovekey. Dovekeys feed along the edge of the ice flows where there are, are a lot of plankton, and that has been their strategy for thousands of years. It worked just fine until the ice flows began to shrink and retreat farther and farther from the islands where the dovekeys breed. And you can imagine, as that ice gets farther and farther away, the dove keys have longer and longer to travel to reach a place where they can get food for their offspring. And they have long been predicted to be an early casualty of climate change. French scientist David Grimley and his team placed transmitters on the birds and wondered how long they would need to fly to their usual plankton meal which was now far away at the edge of the retreating ice. So when they gathered around to collect the first batch of data from their transmitters, they were astounded. Because instead of flying an hour, the dove keys had been in the air for less than four minutes. David and his team realized that the dove keys had found a new food source right on their very doorstep. At the mouth of the fjord, where the milky blue meltwater from island glaciers was slamming into the dark, cold currents of the Arctic Ocean and creating this place of plenty for the dove keys to feed upon the stunned plankton. The dove keys continue to thrive by being flexible enough as a species to switch up their traditional feeding patterns and adapt quickly to a changing environment. The new dovekey behavior is not a permanent solution to climate change. The glaciers on those islands will melt away and disappear, but it buys the dovekeys time to find other ways to adapt to a warmer world. Plants and animals all over the world adapting their behavior, sometimes changing their bodies, sometimes even evolving in response to climate change. Not all species will have the ability to adapt quickly enough to climate change. The mouse-like bramble key melomies in Australia recently became the first mammal species confirmed as a climate change casualty, when all of its known habitat was flooded by sea level rise. So studying climate change biology does not make scientists worry less about the crisis, but it can help them to worry smart. Learning which species are more resilient, and which are most at risk so that we can allocate scarce resources in terms of research and conservation and policy to the species that need our help the most. We can take inspiration from plants and animals in terms of our own response to the crisis. After all, if a tiny lizard can evolve in response to climate change, then it stands to reason we can change some of the behaviors that are bringing it about.